Hey now, brawlers, it's time for another Board Game Brawl review with Nick Meanahan, sponsored by BoardGameBliss.com. Hey now, today we're going to take a look at a Study in Emerald 2nd Edition from Tree Frog Games and designer Martin Wallace, that is his company, and distributed in the U.S. by Gray Fox Games. This is the second edition of the first edition of A Study in Emerald from Tree Frog Games. I have a proud owner of that first one, which is currently out of print and I think going for Buku Bucks right now. I'm not entirely sure. So if you're not familiar with The Study in Emerald, it's actually based off of a short story by Neil Gaiman. They put his name very, very prominently on the front cover of the new edition. Uh, he is uh, a horror, science fiction, fantasy writer that I've been a big fan of for a number of years. And he did a short story called A Study in Emerald, which uh, posited that um, it was a Cthulhu-based H.P. Lovecraft story that posited that the Elder Gods, the Great Old Ones, already won a long time ago back in like the 19th century and um they have taken over their nobles are in place in all the different cities around the world but life kind of goes on but there are restorationists who are trying to overthrow them and usurp them and put life back to normal and they are led by sherlock holmes and watson and all of his allies and they are fighting against moriarty who is a loyalist working for the great old ones and their royalty now, mechanically speaking, the first edition of the game was area control with some deck building and a lot of funky Great Old One stuff going on all around the board. Zombies and vampires and Cthulhu popping out and destroying a city and all of these different things. Assassinations for the royalty. The fact is, the second edition of the game, which has been quite controversial among some fans of the original edition of the game, we'll talk about that more in my final thoughts, the second edition has all of that stuff. The core of the game is exactly the same, but there are some significant details that have changed just to make the game more streamlined, a little bit easier, uh, less complex, easier to teach, and so on. But it is still very, very similar. Let me go ahead and give you a full overview of the game. If you haven't played it before, if you have no idea what I'm talking about with the first edition, that's fine. I'll also have links to my original review, reviews, plural, of the first game. Um, but then we're going to come back and I'll tell you some of the differences that I noticed between the two editions and also tell you what I think about this edition. All right, I'm going to give you a very brief overview of A Study in Emerald 2nd Edition. This is a game for two to five players. I have it set up for a five-player game, hence all the different colors of cubes and uh, agent tokens out on the board. The goal of the game is to have the most victory points by the end of the game. The game is going to end in one of three different ways. First off, you have a Loyalist track and a Restorationist track in the center of the board. I'll explain what those mean in a moment. But if either of these tracks ever gets to 10, the game is going to end immediately. Uh, also, if any of the players are forced to go insane, uh, you're going to have each player starts off with three insanity tokens on top of their uh, secret, uh, hidden, uh, a faction uh, roll card. If you lose all three of your sanity tokens and therefore go insane, you have to reveal yourself uh, and what your role is. At which point, you, if you're a restorationist player, then you are going to uh, the game is going to end immediately because if any of the restorationist players are revealed, the game just ends. It's also possible for the card to get flipped over if there are no more. If you as a player have no more agent tokens out on the board. And finally, the game can end when a victory point threshold is reached. This is the victory point track. Uh, depending on the number of players, whether it's 5, 4, 3, or 2, if that amount of victory points is met, the game is going to end. Now, A Study in Emerald is a game of area control. You're trying to take control of all of these different cities that are out on the board because by doing so, by having a majority of both your influence tokens and your agents in these cities, you can do a number of things. You can take control of a card that's on the top of the stack because this is a deck building game, although it's more of a broad scopes <laughs> deck building game. Uh, so getting cards from each of these cities is gonna enable you to flush out your deck and make it stronger and get access to the cards that are gonna be very useful for you. But also having more agents in the city means it's easier to assassinate the uh, great old one royalty, uh, which you may or may not want to do depending on your loyalty in the game. So first, a little more about the setup. You notice there are all these little uh, 
tokens out on the board. These are called your agent pawns. At the start of the game, once you get finished with the rest of the setup, each player is going to go in turn order and put one agent out into the city and then a second one. City uh, Agents can start off in the same spot as their own agents or as other players' agents. It doesn't really matter so long as at the end of it all, uh, each player ends up with two agents out on the board. You're going to put five of your influence cubes in what is called limbo. This is a section of the board where you do not have access to these cubes, but you may be able to gain them later by taking a very specific action. You'll also start off with more agents in your own available stock and five other influence cubes that are readily available. There's a sanity die because it is a Cthulhu themed game. Whenever you are in danger of losing one of your three sanity tokens, you have to roll the die. If it comes up with that symbol, then you are going to lose a sanity. Uh, I believe there are only two good faces on this dice that do not have that insane symbol. And then there are zombie tokens, which are going to be very specifically used for one particular card in the game. Now, each player will have a uh, confidential secret identity card, which I already showed you that one is uh, Restorationist, but you do not reveal that to any of the other players during the course of the game. It either says Restorationist or Loyalist. Those are the two different factions in the game. And this is very important because you want to try and have the most victory points by the end of the game, but whichever, uh, there's going to be three Restorationist cards and three Loyalist cards. No matter what the number of players is, you're going to shuffle them all up and deal them out. So the number of players who may be Restorationist or Loyalist can fluctuate rapidly. I mean, let's say that in this example of five-player game, there could be three Restorationists and two Loyalists. There could be, um, you know, opposite of that. They could be more of an even split. There might be... Um, in a four-player game, there might be three Restorationists and one Loyalist, or vice versa, and so on and so forth. Notice that these are slightly different. The Restorationist just says that if you, you reveal if you lose all of your agents or if you lose all of your sanity, and if revealed, the game ends immediately. But the Loyalist says that you reveal if you lose all your agents or sanity, but the game will continue. And if you have less than three agents on the board while revealed, place agents until you have three agents on the board. In any case, I digress a bit, but at the end of the game, whichever faction has the lowest scoring player, everyone that belongs to that faction is going to lose five victory points. So that's a very important thing to note. You kind of want to work with your teammates if you can identify them, because you don't get to know who your teammates are. You have to uh, just hope that you're deducing by their actions what they really are. Some of the things you do during the game are going to influence the Loyalist and Restorationist track. They, both those tracks will start off at zero, but they will go up during the course of the game. And whatever the difference in points is between those two numbers, that's the amount of points that the other players are going to lose. So for instance, if at the end of the game this was where we stood, then the Loyalist players would each get five points, but at the uh, and if the Restorationist players raise up the track during the course of the game, they gain two points, but if you end in that allotment, since uh, five minus two is three, that means that all the rest, the Loyalists would maintain their points, but all the Restorationists would lose three points. So you want to have your teammates' track go up as high as possible um, and hope that a rising tide will float all boats on your side and push all the other players down, especially since having forcing the other players to have the lowest scoring teammate uh, could really help your overall score. I realize it's a little bit difficult to understand. Maybe it'll become clear as I explain the rest of the game. The scoring is probably the most difficult thing to explain about this game. Now, the other bit of setup that you have to do is each of the different uh, city piles. You're going to have a different amount of cards based on the number of players uh, randomly from the main deck. Uh, and For five players, it's actually going to be five cards. But no matter what, there's two particular cards you're always going to have in every city. The first is the actual city card. Um, and remember, this is like a deck building game, so you'll be able to gain this into your deck uh, later on to add to your starting deck. So this is the Constantinople card. At the top of the card, it's going to have a few different things. First off is victory points. Now, those happen to be neutral victory points. If they were green, they'd be loyalist points. If they were purple, they would be uh, purple um, or restorationist points. No matter what, color it is, you're always going to gain those points right away during the course of the game. But at the end of the game, when you reveal your identity, you may have to lose points depending on which type of loyalty 
uh, you, uh, w depending on what type of points you gain during the course of the game, but you'll always keep your neutral points. And then over on the side, there'll be other icons indicating what type of actions you can do. I'll explain more about those in a moment. But every city space is going to have a city card shuffled into the stack of cards, so that may pop up. There's also going to be royalty cards. These are the great old ones, followers, or like sub-commanders that take control of all these different major cities. So you have Yig and Yarlotep. And they are worth victory points if they are assassinated. If you're a restorationist, you're going to gain those points at the end of the game for assassinating them if you have control of this card. When you assassinate them, it doesn't go into your deck. It goes off into like your player area and you keep it till the end. But when you assassinate them, you also have to lose sanity. Hence, it's got that sanity symbol there. The number in the little explosion is how many bomb symbols you need in order to kill, to assassinate these particular great old ones. And bomb symbols are from your cards, but also from your agents. Each agent counts as a bomb symbol. Let me show you some of the other cards in the game. They won't make total sense, um, but I think it's the easiest way for me to show you what all the different symbols in the game are. So that's kind of the most, uh, if, if the scoring is the most difficult thing to explain, explaining the symbology is the second most difficult. So you have these character cards like Sigmund Freud. Now he's a one-use action card, which means that if you put him in your deck and then use him later on, then he uh, gets go, he, you, and you use his action instead of the icons, then he's gone from your deck forever. In this game, when you use a card, you always choose one thing to use it for. So if he had multiple icons on the top, you would play him as one of those icons, ignore the others. If you play him only for his action in his box that is the only thing you use on the card and you ignore all the symbols on the top so his action is that you regain all of your sanity markers and move the restorationist marker two spaces up the track if you had used him for his icon on the top that symbol means retrieving influence cubes you can take influence cubes off of the board off of city spaces where you've already placed them or you can take them back from limbo and uh well we'll cover more about that later uh, Mrs. Hudson has a free action, which means she can do it at any point, including at the start of your turn. This card and draw replacement cards, including one for this card. You have Dr. Watson. He has a lot of symbols. His free action is draw two cards from your deck. Uh, up at the top, we'll go over these symbols here. The railroad symbol here lets you, for each one of those, you get to move an agent to another city. Uh, this blue symbol that has a first on it means that you can claim a card at the start of your turn uh, as your first action if you have enough influence in the city. This one that looks like an influence cube but with an arrow pointed down in blue means that you get to place influence cubes down in the city. Uh, this bomb symbol is if you try to do an assassination attempt, it gives you a bomb symbol to use. And then finally, uh, when you claim this card, because he has a little agent symbol here in the center, that means you actually get to put one of your agent tokens down on the board when you claim him. Professor Moriarty, he has a lot of the same symbols, but some new ones here. The A is for assassination, meaning you can play him to start an assassination. But he also has two bombs. But if you use him as, use him as an assassin, you don't get the access of his bombs. See how that works? You have to use him as one icon. Um, and he also has... Uh, one of the track arrows which means that for this particular card you get to move three the loyalty track up three spaces if you use it for that there's also cards like that to do it for the restoration track now he's an assassin that also has um an ability down here which means that when he assassinates another agent um, you can assassinate either royalty or agents in this game, rival agents. You get to claim that agent with Professor Moriarty, and at the end of the game, if you're a loyalist, you get five victory points for having done so. Uh, Sherlock Holmes, his ability is an interrupt. You can negate any action that would eliminate one of your agents. Cthulhu himself, he has a one-use action, and you see that when you... Uh, claim him uh he has you uh get three victory points at the end of the game but also you take a sanity hit uh one use action remove all cards agents and zombies from one city all influence cubes go to limbo uh the nader here is really good for just transporting a lot of people really quick the necronomicon gives you three neutral points but you do take a sanity hit the infernal mechanic is a one-time use thing that gives you three bombs <laughs> Irene Adler has a one-time use action to replace any agent with one of your agents. Here's a Shogoth, which you should know from Cthulhu lore. As a one-use action, you can eliminate an agent, and if you're a loyalist, you get three points for doing so. Hide Royalty is a one-use action. You can claim a royalty card on display where you have the most pieces. Retain uh, points at the end of game if you are a loyalist. Uh, that means you get to take the royalty card without actually assassinating it. 
here's the uh, hired assassin card. Now players, this is one one of the easier cards to get in more common cards. He can be used as an assassin or as a bomb. And again, if you kill an agent with him, it may get me points for you at the end. Zombies. This is where you can use those zombie tokens. As an action, you may remove one agent from each location with zombies in it, and then place two zombies in any one location. Uh, the Migo, as a one-use free action, you move one, you move two of your agents from the board to this card as a free action. You may place them onto any locations in a later turn. And finally, Terrors of the Night force one player to make a sanity roll. Those are just some of the cards in the game, just to give you a taste for what you can expect. Now, each player is also going to get a starting deck of cards of your color. These are just going to be basic things, uh, that like the Assassin um, and different symbols here. Just some of the different basic cards that you can use, and you'll be adding more cards to it. If you're not familiar with deck building, it just means you start off with all players start off with a simple deck that you will be adding more cards to by control by claiming them, putting them in your discard pile, and when you have to reshuffle, you'll reshuffle all the cards together, which means you may get the better cards later on. You're going to draw five cards at the start of the game, and you do not automatically draw cards in this game. Rather, at the end of your turn, well, I'm sorry, you do draw cards, but you don't discard your cards. So at the end of your turn, uh, you draw back up to five, but if there's any cards you didn't use, then those are stuck in your hand. So how this will work is that you'll figure out who's going to go first, and then in clockwise order, you'll take your turns. On your turn, you have two actions to do, and you have all of those different actions that I described from the icons on the card to, as your options to do. And when you choose to do one of those actions, you play all of your cards for that action at one time. So if I want to place influence cubes, I might place... I may play all three of these cards, since they all have a placing influence cube symbol on them, at the same time as part of one action and put all three of my cubes into one city. It can be any city that I want. It doesn't have to be where I have my agents. Then at the start of my turn, as the first action I do, and this is the only action that follows this rule, I can choose to claim a card that I have the majority of influence on. I have to have at least one cube there, but my agents also count towards my influence total. As long as I have one cube and a, uh, at least one cube there with my agents and a clear majority of uh, influence points, I'm going to be able to claim that card, take it into my deck, flip over the next card on the stack, and that's that. If the card that is flipped over is a royalty card, which could happen even at the start of the game, it slides down into the slot underneath that city spot so that it's exposed itself, but the next card will flip over on the top of the stack. Now, when a, claim, when a card is claimed, then the cubes that I use to claim that card go into limbo, which means that eventually I'm gonna run out of cubes, and that's when I would use the retrieve cube action to take those back or to take them back from other city spaces where I think they're just futilely hanging out there. I could choose to move my agents around with that railroad action if I think that they were going to be more useful in other spots. Remember that agents count as bombs, so more agents in a spot means it's more likely you can assassinate royalty or another enemy agent. And then there's all the other actions. You can assassinate, you can uh, move up the different tracks, and so on and so forth. When one of the end game conditions is met, you are going to divvy up, total up all of your points, any points that you gained that are actually legitimate because you are the faction that they apply to, like assassinating royalty gets you points if you're a restorationist, assassinating agents gets you points if you're a loyalist. If you are not that actual agent, you have to lose those points, and that's that. That is a quick run-through of a study in Emerald 2nd Edition. Whoever has the most points is the winner of the game. Try not to let your faction have the weakest player. Now let's get to my final thoughts. All right, so what are the differences? To be honest, I have I did not make it a point to play the first edition again before I played the second edition because I played the first edition like six times. It was a while ago, but I think I, I got the gist of it. And I remembered a lot of the important details, um, but I'm not 1,000% sure I remember every single small subtle difference. But I know the big ones. Um, a lot of it you can notice right away if you watch the overview, if you've played the first edition before. There are now the only cards you can purchase are down mixed in with all the different cities. There's no like lineup of cards that you purchase from. It's no longer about you um, taking control of a city card and then it may be rusted away from you. You gain it and you gain it and that's that. And you have to wait for the royalty to show up. Then you can assassinate them. Um, the way that the scoring works is probably the most significant difference. Because in the previous edition of the game, it was if your team... Uh, I believe I have this right, if I remember correctly. If your team 
was in last place. If one of your team members, whether you're a loyalist or restorationist, had the least amount of points, nobody on your team could win. That's it. Your entire side was eliminated from contention. Then it came down to the other side and whoever had the most points. In this case, it's almost the same, but it's just that everyone on your team loses five points, which is still pretty significant. It's still pretty damaging, but it certainly does not take you completely out of contention if you were in the lead for your particular team that just got dinged with that point loss and there are other things too like the zombies and vampires are not nearly as powerful as they were before especially the zombies there's no game ending winning condition with them as far as uh, they're concerned it's very easy to move your agents around the city now before you had to pay to move between different areas and you don't have to do that anymore now it's just like play a card that has um, that symbol on it, boom, you can go anywhere that you want. The map feels smaller, more compressed because of things like that. Everything in the game just feels more to the point, more direct, more just getting to it, to what the core of the game is supposed to be. Um, the artwork did get an overhaul as well. The board doesn't look as cluttered as it did before, and that's both good as bad. I thought the board was a bit more artistic in the original version. This one, as with all the mechanisms of the game, is more streamlined, but it still looks pretty good. I like the artwork on the cards, uh, perhaps a little bit more than I liked the artwork in the original edition because it is more full color artwork. It's It just looks a little more polished. I understand what they were going for with the first edition's artwork of it being a little, um, the, the black and white for most of it's stark and contrasting, um, but I like what they did here a little bit more. The cover looks much more fantastic and more like a movie cover or a book cover which is what they were going for to make that Neil Gaiman name stick out very prominently and move more copies I totally understand that from a business perspective so I think the graphic design overall is a bit better than the first edition and the theme is still solid of these secret agents running around the city working for their side not knowing who else at the table is really on their side trying to have these assassinations and um, or trying to protect the great old ones and, and all these different things, that is still there. That is still intact as far as I'm concerned. And the mechanisms of the game overall, it still feels like the same game. It just feels like it's a shorter, simpler version, which everyone kind of already suspected about this. It just matters what perspective you're coming to the game with. Some people are definitely not going to like that about this. Some people loved the complexity and the challenge of, of sifting through the rules of uh, the original Study in Emerald, much like many of Martin Wallace's earlier games, uh, some of his more complex like train games and things like that. People love that crunchiness. Um, but for me, even though I really enjoyed the first edition of Study in Emerald, it never hit the table after it, my first like gout of plays that I had with it because I knew that it was long to set up. or Not necessarily set up, but to play. Um, I knew that it was long to teach. I always have new people coming in and out of my group. So I'm like, if there's even one person I have to teach, that's going to add at least a half hour to the game time because it is a very complex game with lots of details, lots of particular unique situations. If this happens, this entirely new mechanism has to happen. There is not nearly as much of that in this game. It feels much more intuitive. There is still complexity figuring out the icons and figuring out how you can manipulate your actions and how the influence system works, how the scoring works. Those things are still crunchy and still kind of tough to get through, but not to the degree that it was in the first edition of the game. So if I can cut to the quick here, because I know what most people want me to say is, uh, do I think that this is better or worse than the original version? For me, they're both great. I think that they can coexist if you have both versions. I already had the first version. I wanted to see what this one was like. I was totally on board with a uh, more streamlined version. And I found that I missed some of the complexity from the original while definitely loving the fact that this was so much easier to get into and get out of at the end of it. And so I like them both. Um, now, if you already have the first edition and you are perfectly happy with it, you your group is fine with how long it takes, you're fine with teaching it to new people, do I think you need to get this edition? Probably not. 
Uh, but on the other hand, if you had the same issues that I did, which is like, hey, I want something faster. Hey, I want something easier. I want something that looks a little bit better, easier for people to jump into then certainly you want to give it a try. And because the first edition is now out of print, if you're in the other group of people who do not have the first edition of the game, who want it, who are like, what was all the hubbub about? Why does this have so much critical acclaim now? I think you would be perfectly happy with this edition of the game. I do not think you are missing so much from the original that this is going to hurt your the standing of the game. It, it really isn't. Everything, the core elements of what people love about the first edition of the game is here. It's here. It's faster to get to. Yes, you miss some complexity that does add some thematic elements, but not enough to hurt it. I really don't believe so. So if you've been clamoring for a copy of Study in Emerald and you just didn't want to pull the trigger on spending so much money for an out-of-print copy, definitely check this one out when it comes out. I do not think you will be disappointed. I think it's a fantastic game no matter how you play it, and this one is going to be the more readily available one. So definitely look forward to it. I am my opinion and my esteem of the of both games is definitely rising as time goes on. Very well designed game, really becoming a fan of Martin Wallace. One of the best Cthulhu games there is. That is A Study in Emerald, second edition. No matter which one you play, you'll enjoy it. Thanks for watching. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon. And make sure to check out our sponsor, Board Game Bliss, where you can find an amazing selection of games from around the world. BoardGameBliss.com. Thanks for your support.